May is National Mental Health Awareness Month. For the agricultural community, this is a very real issue with farming having one of the highest rates of suicide in any profession. I'm Jane Seabright, Director at the Center for Dairy Excellence. In the past few months, we've been working with several organ agricultural organizations, including the other Ag Excellence Centers, to increase awareness around farm stress and mental health. Joining me today to talk about that is Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture, Russell Renning, Tara Haskins, who is the Total Farm Health Director for AgriSource Safe Network, and Ginger Fenton, who is a member of Penn State's Farm Stress Team. Today, we're gonna to have a conversation about this important topic in the ag community. Often mental health issues go undetected in the farm because of the nature of the job. Secretary Redding, Ginger, and I are still involved in farming, and we know all too well how farm stress can affect the mind. Farmers work independently, and so often, much of what we do is wrapped into who we are. We don't go to the doctor as much as we should, and we don't often admit when we need help because we wanna show that we're strong enough to do things on our own. The reality is though, mental health affects every American at some point in our lives. And we need to understand this. We need to understand when farm stress is something greater than what we can tackle on our own and where to go for help, whether it's for ourselves or for someone we love. So let's begin. Can each of you begin by telling me a little bit about how you're involved in increasing mental health awareness and the dangers of farm stress? Let's begin with Secretary Redding. Jane, uh, thank you, first of all, for you know, hosting uh, this important discussion about farm stress and, and not just acknowledging that it exists, but sort of what we can do about it and, and what resources are there to help uh, both our farm and farm families uh, navigate stress. I've said often that agriculture and stress are synonymous, right? It's, it's partly, it comes with the territory, but when it, there's a tipping point, uh, as, as we know happens, uh, that can happen seasonally, it can happen during transitions, it can happen, you know, as market fluctuations. You know, we need to also recognize the boundaries and, and what can we do to help? And I think that's where, uh, where we as a department and personally have uh, really tried to, to be more intentional about what we do about stress. Part of it's talking about it, but it's also making sure that there are resources there. You know, Jane, you and I have worked over the years, uh, you know, on dairy issues and, and have ridden this wild roller coaster just as one example, right? One, uh, one segment of Pennsylvania agriculture. But uh, we were there when, you know, you're hitting very bottom and really worried about folks who are calling you to, and saying you wish there was more you could say, then uh, I hope this works out for you. Right, or I hope the markets improve. And to me, it's the uh, it's the recognition that you know the work that we do also in, involves humans, right, on both sides. Human beings who are in this business of agriculture and humans that we're on the other side that we're feeding and care about. But we have to make sure that we feed and care for those who are also in the business of agriculture and mm -hmm. know that the life they're living, it's incredibly <clears throat> important work. But there's also stress that, that comes with that and making sure that we have um, you know, some measures in place to, to help them. Uh, there are unique circumstances inside of agriculture, right? There are weather, there are markets, there are farm transitions, there are legacy issues to deal with. And, and many of those stress both the individual and they stress the extended family members. Uh, we, we know that for sure. I've lived that both as a family of one of 11 children and, and trying to figure out how to navigate a farm transition to the most recent with my, my uh, wife and her family. And you know, just stress inducing is one further example to that. Um, but we also know that people are more aware of stress, right? So I think making sure that we as a department, as, as you know, service providers, if you will, that are with us today and by extension, many others, that we also engage with them and, and talk about, about stress. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the, <clears throat> one of the um, things that we did um, as an outgrowth of, of some 
field hearings that we did with Senator Vogel, who's the chairman of the Senate Ag Committee here in Pennsylvania, uh, was to say, what more can we do? And that was really the genesis for working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture on the Farm and Ranch Stress uh, Assistance Network um, that gave us access both to, uh, to a structure here in Pennsylvania, but it also took full advantage of the national network, right, of other expertise that we'll hear from today as well. So we'll talk more about that, but I'm really proud that this conversation has evolved from simple acknowledgement of stress to what we can do about it. And how do we talk about it? And how do we engage with people who have resources to address it? And most importantly, never forget that the there are human beings that we're dealing with and they need our care and in so many ways, not just our assistance. So uh, really proud of that. The grant we can talk more about, but it's got multiple components to it. It's the, um, you know, it, it's the programming side. And, and Jane, you've mentioned this about working with other centers of excellence and, and Certainly that's a piece, the National Young Farmer Coalition, the statewide education campaign that Penn State and others, it's the Agri-Stress Helpline uh, available 24 hours a day. And we'll give more detail to that uh, later on, but uh, that is really an important part of the conversation. So a long answer to say, you know, we're trying to raise this up, uh, engage on it, uh, resources for it, uh, and bring that human element into this conversation about ag and what we do to support it and grow it uh, and make sure that it transitions successfully. It has to include a discussion about the mental health uh, and stress uh, inside of agriculture and how we manage it. So thank you. Yeah, and when you talk about resources and some of the things that are being done to really not only bring awareness to it, but also make sure we're addressing it. Tara and Ginger, you guys are both doing some really unique things. So Tara, why don't you talk a little bit about what AgriSafe is doing? Um, yes, yeah, sure. So thank you for having me. My name is Tara Haskins and I am the Total Farmer Health Director at AgriSafe. Uh, I have 35 years of experience as a registered nurse. Half of my career has been spent in mental health. Um, my master's is in psychiatric mental health. I spent a lot of time in academia teaching nursing students about psychiatric mental health, and I've been passionate about this topic for so long. Um, in addition to that, I come from a very small town in North Louisiana, and so I understand the culture that we have in rural America. I understand the power of that culture, but I also understand sometimes the pitfalls and the barriers that those individuals sometimes encounter when they're wanting to seek mental health treatment or to understand mental health um, as well as um, physical health as well. AgriSafe is a national nonprofit. Uh, we focus on uh, occupational health and safety <clears throat> across the board. Uh, we not only work in mental health space, which is where I'm here talking to, uh, talking to you about today, but we also cover all of the other um, uh, hazards that uh, farmers and ranchers, people working in agriculture, fishing and forestry encounter in their daily work. Because we know that occupation is very uh, integral to uh, a person's total health because you spend at least eight, and for many, uh, especially farmers and ranchers, many more hours in a day doing that work. And that impacts how you feel, that impacts your perceptions, that impacts your health and that impacts your um, injury risk as well. So um, about 65% of we estimate of what AgriSafe is doing right now is in the space of mental health. Um, some days it feels like 100% because um, we have so much to do. Um, my role in working in farm stress and mental health has been sort of multifocal in AgriSafe. I am the mental health lead. And so I have other staff members that are um, uh, that I supervise that are under me that are working in this space. We are looking at outreach in these communities. Um, I really am very passionate about the power of community and, and understanding those community needs and what they see is important to them because we can't be effective if we don't address that. Um, I've been integral in uh, developing some uh, programs, which I'll talk about later, to address some of the cultural aspects of mental health in the, in the farming and ranching community. 
Thanks, Tara. Ginger, you want to talk a little bit about what Penn State and the Farm Stress Team is doing? Sure. Um, thank you for including me in the conversation today, Jane. I appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to note the other hat that I wear with extension is as a member of the dairy team. Mm -hmm. So that has what is what has drawn me into this conversation. Um, in 2018, some of us who work with dairy farms were noticing more frequent calls. In extension, we say that we get more calls when times are really good because people have money to do projects sometimes or when times are bad. And we were, we're getting more calls for sure because of the the toll and the, the detrimental effects that we were seeing um, a prolonged period of depressed milk prices having on our producers. So a group of us were able to become trainers and to start offering workshops and developing more resources for farmers and for also for those that support the ag industry. Penn State Extension formally started a farm stress team about two years ago. The team is comprised of educators from various program areas, including agriculture. Um, so we have animal systems represented. We have uh, people from the energy business and community vitality team, as well as the food families and health team. And it's a nice interaction because we can draw on each other's expertise. Also as an ag industry professional, I feel very strongly that we need to equip our folks that are visiting farms or interacting with farmers every day with the basic skills that they need to know how to respond to a farmer who's struggling. So we can help by increasing awareness, encouraging those conversations, such as for farmer discussion groups, and then providing the tools that they need to respond to a farmer or a fellow ag professional when they're in need. Thanks, Ginger. So let's get started. Um, Natalie, you, uh, you mentioned that you work in the health profession. So um, what do you think, why do you think mental health and some of the things that you've done through Igress Safe, why do you think mental health issues often go undiagnosed on the farm? Um, well, I, I believe there, there are many factors at play. Um, first, we know that the majority and probably 90% agricultural producers and workers are gonna live in rural areas access to mental health providers is still a challenge in rural America. Um, every time I go to a conference or a meeting, this topic is always being talked about. Our healthcare system, I think, needs to do a better job of reaching and keeping qualified mental health providers that understand the challenges facing this population. You know, we, we cannot provide relevant care to an individual without having some knowledge of their lived experience. Um, and also a willingness to want to learn more about that lived experience. And this not only applies to mental health professionals, but to all healthcare providers, because our agricultural communities encounter healthcare providers at many different junctions. It may be a primary care visit. They're there with symptoms or physical symptoms that could be attributed maybe to mental distress. They could be entering in an emergency room type setting. Uh, they may be encountering someone in the community. And so healthcare providers may come in contact with uh, people in this community, you know, at all different junctures. Uh, when they are seeking answers to both their physical and mental symptoms of things such as anxiety, depression, and substance use disorders. And that distance and sometimes the perceived distance can be a barrier. So um, options that provide services that address the needs and concerns of ag producers and workers is really important. Um, things such as telehealth, telecounseling, other options that are a little bit more convenient. Um, and I think some of these um, uh, some of these options will help initial engagement for treatment, but we also not only want them to present to treatment initially, we want them to come back and to finish. And if they, we want them to have a good experience because, you know, if we can resolve the situation with an individual and they encounter problems later on down the future, you know, we don't want that experience to be one that, it, you know, is perceived as negative. We want them to feel comfortable coming back. And then next, I think all of us can relate that when we are experiencing mental distress, we 
uh, or, or concerns about our, our well being, we weigh our options based on our life priorities. And this is no different for agricultural communities. But some of the differences within the work of agriculture is that that work can be nonstop. That work can be, uh, can change, you know, based on weather or, um, or, you know, some other unexpected event that requires a producer, you know, to have to change their plans. Um, during certain times of the year, you know, they're out there nonstop. And then there are some productions like dairy, <clears throat> which I know Ginger can certainly speak to. That's every day, you know, 365 days a year. So taking a vacation or taking time off, you know, to reach out for help can sometimes be perceived as a barrier. And then um, we also need to remember that, that uh, farmers take pride and they feel responsible for the animals and the land that's in their care. They, they, really, they really take that to heart. And that along with financial response, their feeling of financial responsibility and keeping those farms in their family is, a, is their priority. So all of these pressures can be great. And um, you know, options that can make it more convenient to enter into uh, a, helping, a helping situation with a healthcare provider and also to feel comfortable receiving that treatment um, could, could be very beneficial for this population. Thanks, Tara. So Secretary Redding, um, Tara talked a little bit about, you know, some of the stigma, some of the issues around availability of care and just time. But fundamentally, why do you think that mental health is such an important, important issue within the ag community and one that we really need to take seriously? Yeah, I, there, there are several reasons, but uh, first among them um, is the you know, expectations that I think that we have uh, on the ag uh, industry generally, but farmers specifically, you know, I just think we have to acknowledge that, you know, the weight of the world is on them and, mm -hmm. and they feel that, right? They won't express that uh, directly, but they, you know, they, they know that stress is there. Um, so I think it's just important that we you know, look at this as, you know, part and parcel to being in the business is the care for the individuals and, and the families and the folks who are on, uh, on these operations and, and in, in the operations, you know, because I think the benefit here is not just the farmer, you know, it's the spouse, it's the siblings, it's the employees. And uh, it's one of the things that we were most interested in as we wrote this grant is to make sure that there was nobody inside of agriculture in the, in the ag community who was excluded, you know, from participation in the agri stress uh, network. And I think that's important. Um, but also say that, you know, the, the farm community is, is good at dealing with seasons, right? We accept, you know, there's the haying season and the planting season, and harvest season, tax season, you know, make, make your list. And all of those, you know, are seasons of the year, but they're also reflective of where the stress points are and, and how we need to be attuned to that. Um, and those factors weigh heavily, certainly every day. Um, you know, the American Farm Bureau did a study and I was particularly, uh, you know, interested in and concerned about, you know, when they uh, looked at 61% of the farmers and farm workers are experiencing more stress uh, than they did just a year ago. Right. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised by that. Right. I, I think, but it tells me that it's not just about market fluctuations where, you know, uh, stress occurs. It's all of the other contributors to that. So I think we just have to be upfront about it, uh, be bold enough to engage in the conversations, be caring enough to, to witness, you know, what is going on and, and make sure that we uh, engage the folks who are frontline with with the uh, farmers, the service providers, and the co-ops, and extension, and rural utilities, and make your list. But I don't think it's a single person's responsibility to be aware. Um, because when you're aware, I think is what we've noticed, when you're aware, then you start thinking about, well, what is the access for primary care? Well, how many you know, specialists do we have? How do you cover those costs? Uh, are we uh, taking into consideration uh, the stress, mental health and stress and stress generally as we talk about our program, 
knowing that people may be distracted if they're stressed. So I think it's just a, a really important evolution of the work that we're doing collectively. And as I noted earlier, finally having something uh, tangible to point to uh, and, and meaningful to help folks through these situations of stress. So uh, again, it's the human side that uh, is both, I think, acknowledged by us talking about it, but it's also to the greater public. It's recognizing that as we witness through COVID, that these folks are in life-sustaining businesses. Mm -hmm. And it, you also have to be concerned about sustaining life if you're in the life-sustaining business, right? So it's that side that appeals to me here. Uh, and I think the work and very gracious of each of you to be with us today to talk about it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think I always like, and um, we talk about, you know, farmers have so much responsibility on their shoulders and have the weight of the world on their shoulders, but it's like the airplane analogy. If you don't, you know, if you don't take care of yourself first, you can't take care of anyone else. And I think knowing that um, it's okay to get help and that there's resource, resources out there to make sure that you're taking care of yourself is really important. So let's talk a little bit about some of the stigmas that are related to farm stress and mental health in the ag community. Uh, we at the Center for Dairy Excellence had worked with the other ag excellence groups to do a survey. We're still bringing in the results of that survey and really looking at the analytics of that. Ginger and her group are working with us on that and a couple others. But one of the things we've seen early on is when you ask farmers and those filling out the survey what the number one, the major obstacles in them getting help in addressing farm stress and mental health, they identified family and embarrassment as the top two um, obstacles. And so let's talk about some of those stigma, stigmas and how we can overcome those and how we can address those. So why don't we start with um, Ginger, since you're doing some of the, re the analytics and what are your thoughts on that question? Sure, um, well, first I'll say Farmers are a tough group, for sure. Um, they're, they're known for being resilient, innovative, creative. And I guess I think of farmers as master problem solvers. You know, that, that's one of the keys of that, why they choose that vocation. It's challenging and they like, like something new and um, yeah, a challenge to tackle. But also sometimes those problems are bigger than they know how to tackle alone. And possibly the thought of addressing their own health issues is overwhelming to them. Is that, that's a bigger issue than they can solve. Um, I think that we can encourage them to interact with other farmers, to look to grow their support network, or in some cases, they may already have a support network. You mentioned the stigma and the concern with family, but maybe to utilize that network that's already in place and to start having those conversations that haven't happened in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I th think we can let them know that there are professionals available to support them. I'm really encouraged by efforts such as this, and there's several other groups that I'm part of that this seems to be an issue that the ag community is tackling together and, and everybody's working together. And I think that's, that's wonderful that we're having those conversations. They need to be part of all of our meetings and our field days and our conferences and our workshops and webinars and, you know, the, and articles. I think we need to, need to spread the word to let people know it's out there and it's okay to have these conversations. That's a really good point, Ginger. It's okay to have these conversations and it's okay not to be okay because we can get you help and there are resources there. So Tara, what are your thoughts on that question? Um, well, I'm, I'm glad uh, Secretary Redding mentioned that American Farm Bureau Federation survey. Um, you know, in addition to what he shared with the audience, um, that survey did find, this was the second survey after the 2019 survey this follow-up survey, when they looked at as rural communities, they said that they did recognize a slight improvement in their communities in stigma. However, 
a large majority of them indicated that we still have a lot to do in this area. And I, I think some of that may be related to the fact that we're all talking about this now, um, which is the biggest diffuser for stigma, you know, uh, that, that we can do is to continue to have the conversations. In terms of uh, this uh, producers, farmers, ranchers, you know, we have to remember that these individuals many times hold positions in their communities um, that are very important. Many of their families have lived in those areas for hundreds of years, and they serve in their own communities as a leader. And so when you hold that position, when you're seen as a, a, a someone that somebody else comes to for advice because you've, you've been in this industry for so long, as many of them have, it, it does make it a little bit harder for an individual to accept and to talk about needing help, whether it's with a friend, a family, or a healthcare provider. And one other aspect of stigma that I do wanna talk about is language. I think we need to do a better job about how we talk about this, you know, mental distress or, uh, or stress itself is not necessarily mental illness. And sometimes the terms that we may use, you know, I myself have been, probably been guilty about that. Uh, we need to be clear about that because sometimes the language and the, the labels that we put on things can sometimes create barriers and can also perpetuate that stigma. You know, we've all needed help at some time or the other. So, you know, whether we call it counseling or coaching, I don't care. I just want someone to get help so they're no longer feeling distressed so they're able to sleep, so they're able to feel better about themselves and their future. That's a really good point, Tara. How we, how we talk about things is important. Secretary Redding, did you have any thoughts regarding overcoming stigmas or anything to add? Well, let me build on, on Tara's point. I mean, I think uh, you know, words are important, right? And uh, how we speak of you know, stress and mental stress. And, and I think there's a spectrum of stress, mm -hmm. right? So recognizing that, and I make the assumption, everybody who's in this business just inherently has some base level of stress, mm -hmm. right? It, it's the question of how, do they, how does it manifest itself, right? How does it reflect, uh, get reflected in their uh, social engagement and relationships in, inside the house and in their own family and with their employees? So I think that's a really important part of just socializing that stress is us. <laughs> you know, it's sort of what, what it is. And we shouldn't shy away from that. I, I feel to some extent sort of emboldened now, having witnessed, right, having witnessed the last couple of years. And I have seen the very, very best in people. And I have seen the very worst in people over the last couple of years. And it has taught me that every single person manages stress differently and exhibits stress differently. And I need to be attuned to that. I need to be aware that there's not a single index, but it is something that is part of what we do. I say all of that as background to make the assumption that in everything we do is we should be thinking about and socializing the terms of, of stress and mental stress. And how does that appear to uh, to, to us and to, to those in, inside of our different uh, communities. Number two, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to talk about it. And that's why the, the American Farm Bureau survey, I think sort of set this up well, that they recognize even within their own membership, um, very well respected both by members and general public and how they present it, I think helps to all of us <clears throat> then talk about it. <clears throat> and here in Pennsylvania, I think some of the local farm bureaus, and we were with several uh, hosted in Johnstown and Western Pennsylvania, give them a lot of credit. You know, they've taken this on as a personal issue within, within their membership. And I think that's uh, really, really helpful. My final point would be that uh, we also have to be aware of the larger issues within healthcare for the farm community. And just like you know, we advocate for nutrition policies you know, to address those who are food insecure, I think we ought to be equally as bold <clears throat> to talk about healthcare for the farm and the extended farm community and where that shows up in our policy priorities as we advocate, I think is important. 
right? Access to basic health care uh, is the, you know, the preemptive strike against further mental health stress, right? Having that access and somebody who's getting, you know, uh, yearly checkups and physicals, I think is part of this sort of change in conversation about what it means to be engaged in addressing the, the needs of the foreign community and addressing the, the stress uh, that's inside of this, uh, inherent in this industry. So yeah, some, some good, good points to build on there with uh, Ginger and, and Tara, so thank you. So Ginger, we talk about um, both, all three of you talked a little bit about um, helping professionals know how to diagnose when stress might be something more than what they can handle. And I know your group is involved in farm stress first aid trainings across the Commonwealth. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that and some of what you share in that workshop to help the farm and the service community? Sure, um, our, our team recently participated in, um, as you mentioned, a series of workshops across the state. We offered five workshops in person um, the, the workshop's titled Communicating with Farmers Under Stress, and as you noted, it targets ag industry professionals. Um, one of those workshops was also hosted online. Um, the, I think the interactions, the conversations were great. Um, they were well received and, and people seemed um, genuinely appreciative of the information. Some of the key points that we covered in those workshops, well, we realized that it draws a diverse, when we talk ag professionals, that's a diverse group. So we start the workshop by you know, uh, setting the baseline, explaining a little bit about um, the, the stressors that specifically affect farmers and talking about them, such as the markets and, and weather, of course. We always, always talk about weather. Uh, then as the workshop progresses, we talk about listening skills. I think that's one of the, the key things that anybody can, a tool that anybody can use. So we discuss listening skills and phrases that can help guide conversations as we, as we interact with farmers. We also talk about planning ahead if you anticipate that you're going to encounter a tough situation. That includes having some specific phrases in mind to use um, and realizing that there are things that you should not promise. Know, as as somebody that might not be in a position to deliver deliver on those promises, but we can help people work through a plan as well. Um, we we stress we are not clinicians. We recognize that, and we don't expect when you attend our workshop and leave that you will be. And we know people have different levels of experience and comfort. So our goal is to provide those attendees with resources including the hotline numbers, um, websites they can go to, and other resources such as articles, webinars, that they can help direct the ag community members who are in need to. I guess I think of the workshops kind of as a conduit between the ag community and, and the professionals that can provide the services. The other thing I, I wanted to mention with these that I think sometimes can be very beneficial to the attendees as well is just that that forum to share and to network. Sometimes the conversations after the meetings that they have and the connections that they make are just about as meaningful as the information that they get during the meetings. Yeah, and that, that's really, I attended one of those meetings and that's what I got out most is how everybody had a story to share. Everybody had some way that they were confronted with having to help someone through an issue. And I thought that was really telling on how serious of an issue this is. So Tara, um, what do you, you know, Secretary Renning had talked about how, you know, there's, there's different levels of farm stress and everybody is dealing with stress in some way. What are some of the symptoms that are warning signs that we should be watching within ourselves or within our neighbors, friends, or loved ones that that level of stress might be more than what we should be trying to tackle on our own? Sure, so there are some general symptoms that um, many of us could probably relate to, things such as um, uh, uh, lack of sleep, not being able to sleep at night, either not being able to go to sleep, not staying asleep or waking up, 
um, uh, much earlier than, uh, than intended. Um, sleep deprivation is a perpetual cycle because that also makes those symptoms of, you know, worry and anxiety even worse. Um, so that is one of the key things that um, healthcare providers really do want to address because if we can't get you to sleep, how are you going to be able to deal with your daytime um, uh, uh, stressors or encounters or, or make decisions? Um, difficulty making decisions, uh, feeling uncertain about their situation, um, being distracted, which is, you know, uh, has many aspects for all of us, but particularly agricultural workers, they work in a hazardous environment mm -hmm. and having their full attention and what they're doing could mean the difference between being successful in a task and ending up in an emergency room with a major injury, which further creates stress. So that distraction is really concerning. Um, uh, uh, feeling uh, lonely, sad, uh, withdrawing from individuals that they typically have encounters with, you know, not showing up for maybe church if they were a regular attender or um, just not interacting with um, family members like they typically do. Um, and then there are some other physical signs that uh, can occur as well. It can occur with uh, decreased appetite, um, um, uh, strains on relationships, which is many times, oftentimes may be evident to others, but maybe not necessarily be evident to that individual experiencing that. And I think that's really important. Recognizing signs within ourselves is many times a challenge because we will always try to figure out ways to explain why that, why that is occurring. And we may not be able to perceive the severity of what that looks like to others on the outside. Seeing symptoms in others, if those are apparent, uh, sometimes that's a little bit, you know, more, that's a little bit easier. Um, but the way we, we have to ask those questions as clinicians, we have to ask those questions pointed uh, because some of those like, you know, if someone doesn't tell me about their sleep and I don't ask about sleep, I'm not gonna know about it. And then some other things to sort of tease out, you know, additional aches and pains, we call those somatic symptoms. Um, and that can be kind of tough with provide with uh, producers because, you know, they do some hard work <laughs> physically and they may have uh, already recovered from previous injuries that had maybe a discomfort or a pain component to it. So, you know, uh, a healthcare provider can kind of tease that out to help to see if this is some a new presentation or something that was uh, pre-existing. And, you know, with regards to sleep, that same concept applies because producers historically we know that sleep deprivation is part of that part of their work risk and so understanding whether this is only related to work versus maybe related to anxiety or worry is really important and I know you, uh, many of the people on this panel would probably be able to talk extensively about the fact that how we perform in our work and, and how we approach our work is oftentimes a direct reflection of how we feel cognitively, how we, our emotions and, and, and our decision making. And so um, the fact that um, the programs you have have individuals going out to farms, talking to them in their environment, there can sometimes be situational or environmental cues, such as, you know, what does the farm look like? You know, and, and particularly with, um, with lenders, you know, how, is the, how are the finances looking? What's next year going to look like? Those individuals have greater insight than healthcare providers can have. So uh, Ginger, I know in your sessions, you talk about if you are one of those egg professionals driving in that farm lane and you do see some of those warning signals, what should you do? I mean, what can you do to help um, someone who you think might be struggling more than um, what they can tackle on their own. Yeah, um, one of the first things I guess that I would tell those professionals is try and if you can get a little background and understand the situation before you ever go so that you're prepared. You maybe know what you're walking into. Um, have, was there a recent accident or a loss in the family? 
you know, is that farm transitioning from one generation to the, another? And so there's added tension due to that. Are they struggling financially? Maybe if you can, you can get a little bit of an idea what's what's happening before you go there um, to be prepared. I mentioned to be ready to listen. I think that's a big part of it too. We know on some of the, the visits and some of the calls that we get that it, it's probably just that somebody needs to talk and listen, that, that we need to, to listen to them. Um, there are specific things. Um, like we mentioned the, the workshops, um, there's ones targeting farmers specifically, there's ones for our ag industry folks. And I think preparing ahead of time, and like I said, having, having whether it's your brochures, cards, hotlines, numbers in place, things that, that you know that you're able to, to give to the, those people when you get there, I think is, is one of the key things that you can do. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, having access to those resources so you can help someone because you never know when you're going to encounter a situation. So let's talk a little bit about um, the resources that are available. Um, Tara, do you want to talk a little bit about the Agri Stress Hotline and how folks can utilize that and what that offers? Uh, sure. So um, as of February 1st, uh, we launched the AgriStress Helpline for Pennsylvania. And that number is 833-897-2474. As of just recently, we also launched the text option for the AgriStress Helpline for Pennsylvania. This line is designed specifically for the agricultural community. It is a crisis intervention line, also with the added component of um, having resources and perhaps referrals that are more ag specific for individuals that call that want to talk to those crisis specialists. Um, it is a 24 seven 365 day a year helpline um, and can also be answered and communicated in in 160 languages. What makes this line so special is that um, the provider that is providing this line in collaboration with AgriSafe, AgriSafe provides the uh, education for those crisis specialists to understand the situation in ag. One of the initial uh, trainings that they take is called Farm Response, which is one of the um, trainings we're actually offering in Pennsylvania. Um, and this is really a deep dive into the breadth of the stressors and the situations that are occurring in agriculture. Many topics, you know, these, uh, you know, individuals would never even know about, and but it's so enlightening to understand that from that agricultural business, the agricultural family, and also the access to care situations. So um, the they get that initial training, and then they get ongoing training through AgriSafe, <clears throat> through our learning lab, in addition to our collaboration with Pennsylvania, they also have a module that they learned about the specifics of agriculture in Pennsylvania. So um, this line shows a lot of promise. Um, there's uh, nothing else like it out there with this collaboration and this intensive uh, education and also ongoing education. Uh, the other thing that AgriSafe does to you know, keep this line vibrant is that we stay abreast of what's happening in the state. For example, just recently, all the issues with the avian flu and uh, having to destroy you know, large flocks of birds that are uh, occurring in Pennsylvania, that information was sent to the uh, crisis specialist. Um, and we do that in collaboration with Pennsylvania. So, so you know, the collaborations go both ways. And so it, it, re it requires a lot of communication, but that, that communication is really important because we want to know, we want those crisis specialists to understand when they start getting calls of people coming in with a similar situation, what is happening in that state and they can better serve them. Um, and the other thing that AgriSafe does is we're constantly looking for more resources that are Pennsylvania specific, um, whether it's ag specific or maybe a new service that has come up for mental health care, connecting to mental health care. Uh, we also want to coordinate with, you know, with the state's 211 
so that they know that this line exists um, and can serve that population in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Tara. I was recently at a meeting and someone suggested putting that AgriSafe name number as a contact in your phone so you would have it at your fingertips in case you would ever need it. Yes. Whether it's for you or for someone else, it's important to write it down. So why don't you go ahead and repeat it again, repeat it mm -hmm. twice, <laughs> while everyone listening can write it down and make sure they have it at their fingertips. Great. So that number is 833-897-2474. <clears throat> One more time, 833-897-2474. That number works for both phone calls and text as well. Thanks, Tara. So, and I do wanna circle back, Ginger, I know your Farm Stress team has some resources online that people can access. So I thought you could just share a little bit of uh, details on how to access those resources. Sure. Um, yeah, the workshop that we previously mentioned, Communicating with Farmers Under Stress, we will continue to offer those in person as well as online. Um, our farm stress teams throughout Pennsylvania, so we are glad to do, we call them on demand, if a business or an organization would like us to come do a workshop or talk to them, we'll be glad to do that. Um, another one that is available via webinar short it's 30 minutes and the, the target audience is farmers it's called mending the stress fences there's another one that's a longer version also for farmers called weathering the storm creating a productive mindset and that's for farmers and families to help them understand the effects of stress on the mind and body and how to manage it uh, our team offers mental health first aid there's a portion that can be found online and is self-paced. And then there's an instructor-led portion that goes with that. And it's a, you can find more information at extension.psu.edu on that course. The other place that I would direct you, if you can't find one that works at Extension and you really want to take that course, just go to mentalhealthfirstaid.org and it lists all of the courses. They're not specific to agriculture but somebody that wants more information, um, I think it's a good, good course to have in your toolbox. Um, the other thing I would like to encourage people to do, get to know your local resources. We have a really good relationship in the county I'm in, for example, with our County Behavioral Health Commission and a county suicide prevention network. And so reach out to those local resources and make connections. I mean, they are very willing to help and this is their area of expertise. And if you can connect them and bring the ag perspective in, I think they, they're appreciative of that. So I would certainly also encourage that. And they offer different workshops too and, and resources. Ginger, I think that's a really good point. Uh, one, of the, one of the individuals at the workshop I attended had mentioned just calling the local hotline and finding out what they have to offer and having a conversation with them about some of ag's needs and just preparing them and connecting them to the local ag community. So I'm gonna ask Secretary Redding to wrap up the call and just share from your perspective why you think every farmer and every person in agriculture should take this issue more seriously and know what to do in an event of emergency or when someone else needs help. So what are your thoughts on that as we close? Yeah, Jane, thank you. Uh, you know, there, there was a note and we were talking about the stigma that you know, the two most significant influences there, one is family, the other is embarrassment, right? And we're, we're you know, uh, all the time talking about how important this community is. I mean, Tara talked about the culture. Uh, I think it's just, making sure that as we look uh, at, at this future that we all sort of talk about or expecting of people who are in this business of agriculture is that is a very challenging place to be. And there are any number of, of things that will stress somebody out at any given point, but having it as part of our sort of public narrative that you know we, we care about you, we care about these farms, we want to see you succeed and part of that is both the products you produce and the relationship you have, you know, uh, in, in the community and, and with the consumer, but it's also a relationship you have right at home, 
right? And the relationship that we have as entity, you know, as land grant universities and supporters and centers of excellence, of departments of ag. So I, I just think that is to me something that uh, we have to just keep uh, emphasizing that that culture is hard to crack, uh, right? But it's also uh, gives us strength in that we know uh, what folks are capable of doing, right? And we know that when there's a call to action, they will respond to that. And I think this is one of the moments of a call to action, right? We need to talk about it, engage with it. We've got resources that both, you know, Tara has noted through our, you know, the network uh, and the new grant, but also Ginger and uh, as mentioned, we've got more resources today than we've ever had to help with the issues of stress. And we understand well that you can't make somebody love what you love, right? But you can be there to try to help them. And we wanna make sure that we are there to help uh, in all forms of this, of this business. So uh, I really think it's important for us to talk about it. Final point would be, and I'm, I'm glad Tara mentioned the high path avian influenza, because as I was listening a little bit here on the front side of the call, uh, is that I think there are really interesting parallels between biosecurity where we speak of it as everyone's responsibility and stress where it's everybody's responsibility, right? I cannot do what I do without support of others and you know, in the biosecurity realm. I think there's interesting parallels there. We just need to, to, to have it be part of uh, you know, our discussions and part of what we engage on, but also be bold enough to encourage folks to address that conversation of stress with the larger family and whatever we can do to, to help uh, provide the resources, of course, as we're doing. But I think one of the most important things is simply talking about it and making sure that we point people where those resources are. But first, you have to acknowledge it exists. Uh, that's both a self-assessment, but also assessment of family. So it's important for us to be in the conversations. So thank you for hosting and, and helping us better understand what to do and what resources are now available. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you for joining me today in this conversation on mental health and farm stress. I think a couple of things I heard is, you know, we really talk about agriculture as a community and what's fundamental to every community is just that it's a, it's a culture of caring for each other. And I think that is really what's fundamental when we talk about mental health and farm stress that we want to be um, cognizant of, you know, before you can we need to make sure we're looking out for each other and we're caring for each other and we're getting the resources and the awareness out there so that we can be that community and we can support each other and help them. And lastly, I think another point that I heard is just talking about it and talking, making sure that we're having those conversations on the farm and in the community and just not being afraid to be there to listen and to talk. So again, thank you so much for joining me and. Um, we really appreciate all that your organizations are doing to help. So thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tara Thanks. and Ginger. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.